Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sudit Parikh and I have the privilege of uh, serving as the CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science uh, and also the executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals. Uh, I want to welcome you to uh, this special uh, special webinar uh, called 21 and Beyond, a virtual discussion with the director of the National Science Foundation and the chair of the National Science Board. Um, you know, if, if this year has taught us anything, uh, it is that uh, we are living in a time of incredible scientific and technological progress. Uh, this, uh, this past year, uh, we, uh, we had some incredible fundamental discoveries. We had incredible uh, applied science um, uh, technology uh, progress. And we had, um, uh, frankly, the fastest development of a, uh, of a public health vaccine uh, ever. And that is all done because of the incredible, um, the incredible investment of both uh, funding and also of uh, human power uh, that the, the United States has put into scientific research since the end of World War II. And when we look at that progress, it's extraordinary. And we realize we're on the cusp of so many other things. Uh, when it comes to health, we're on the cusp of uh, of gene editing therapies that promise not just uh, therapies, but cures for disease. We're on the cusp of technological advances uh, that can speed uh, computing to, uh, to speeds that we've never seen before. Uh, we're on the cusp of awe-inspiring discoveries in the, in the heavens uh, to tell us more about our place in the universe. Uh, and so much of this is being, uh, is being both done and funded by the National Science Foundation. And yet, and yet we realize uh, that we are also on the precipice of, um, uh, of the supporters for this scientific research um, losing that momentum of the American public. Uh, and that there's an opportunity or a challenge in that we could, uh, we could actually see that, um, that progress slow uh, or the fruits of it not be realized uh, by the American public. And so we've really come to this point of inflection a point where we, uh, uh, the, oppor the opportunity is vast, the challenges are high, uh, but that the optimist in me, and I think in uh, the folks you're gonna meet and talk to today, um, I think we see an incredible opportunity in front of us. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today, this inflection point and uh, the vision uh, of the National Science Board and the National Science Foundation for what science and, and research can look like uh, in the years ahead. Um, so I'm going to introduce our, our, uh, our wonderful panelists here in just a second. But first, uh, I thought we'd have a quick poll uh, for our audience, uh, just to sort of set the stage about what your thinking is. Uh, so, uh, Jamie, if you'd pull that poll up, uh, I'd really like to understand where you see the current status uh, of the United States science and engineering leadership. Uh, where we are, are we, uh, do we continue to be a clear leader uh, or are we um, uh, somewhere else on that spectrum? So if you could please uh, vote while I, uh, while I do the introductions, uh, then we will uh, get quickly into this discussion. Uh, we're calling it a fireside chat, you know, these virtual fireside chats. I don't know about you all, but I'm sick of these things being virtual. Uh, I cannot wait uh, to see you all in person. Uh, all right, uh, we are pleased to have with us today two uh, incredibly distinguished, distinguished leaders. Uh, Dr. Sethiraman Panch Panchanathan, uh, serves as the 15th director of the National Science Foundation, the federal agency with the mission to advance fundamental research in all fields of science and engineering, uh, and Dr. Ellen Ochoa, uh, who chairs the National Science Board, which identifies issues critical to NSF's future, establishes its policies, and serves as, uh, as the co-head of the agency. The board also advises the president and Congress on policy matters related to science, engineering, and education. Uh, the two of them are in their first years in their respective positions. Uh, with that being the case, AAAS and the journal Science invited them here to have a wide-ranging discussion about their vision for 2021 and beyond, um, and also to, uh, to answer your questions uh, from uh, hopefully scientists and people who care about science here in the United States. So uh, really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ponch and Ellen, for joining us. Thank you, Sadie, hey. for inviting us. Wonderful. Well, uh, yeah, I'd like to start uh, as we kick off just with a personal question for the two of you. Uh, just starting with Ellen, perhaps. Uh, Ellen, do you remember a particular time or moment in your life when you realized that you wanted to study science and engineering? Uh, well, thank you, Sudeep. I, you know, I think I came to it uh, later and possibly a little bit differently than a lot of people. 
Um, I didn't really know any scientists and engineers when I was in high school. I, I took almost no science classes. I, for some reason, just thought I wasn't interested and, and didn't really see that as part of my future. Uh, fortunately, I took a lot of math. And when I went off to college, I was taking all different kinds of classes, but was you know, finishing up the calculus series and you know, talked to other students in my class. And of course, they were all taking it um, generally because they were uh, engineering or physics students. So I thought I should learn more about those subjects and see if it was something I'd be interested in. I, uh, I went and talked to two professors, one in the electrical engineering department and one in the physics department. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the electrical engineering professor, uh, you know, just didn't see me as someone that looked like an engineer to him. And he made it pretty clear he was not interested in having me in his department. You know, he said, well, we had a woman come through here once, but, um, you know, it's a really difficult course of study. And I don't know that you'd be interested in it, even though I had set up the appointment with him. Uh, fortunately, got a much different um reception from the physics professor who was glad to hear I was interested in physics, told me about some of the careers people could have when they majored in physics, which was actually hugely important because I, I really didn't have a, a good idea of that. And then when he found out, you know, I was finishing up the calculus series, uh, he said, well, if you started into physics next semester, you know, you'd already know the language and you could really concentrate on the concepts, whereas most people will be taking them and learning them both at the same time. So I think you do really well. So perhaps not surprisingly, I started into physics and ended up selecting that as my major. That's extraordinary. It just tells you so much uh, the effect that conversations from mentors and leaders in a field can have uh, and how, uh, how, how much power they have over us. It's incredible. Uh, thank goodness uh, the, the physics professor uh, was encouraging. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Punch, uh, how about you? Yeah, thank you, Sadeep. First of all, I want to thank you and AAAS for putting this together. I think this is exciting. Um, so I wanted to say that, you know, for me, the story is a little bit different because my father was a professor back uh, in India, and um, he uh, was an uh, avid researcher, an upper, upper atmospheric uh, science researcher. And, you know, watching him, and it's a lot more implicit, right? I mean, with your with your dad watching him getting excited about science and he was, used to talk about it at home with so much excitement about radio astronomy and upper atmospheric physics and all of that, that really, you know, I saw him excited and I, I, I know that itself started to build the excitement in me. But actually, you know, you asked about a particular turning point. I will tell you that in 1969, of course, you know, we had the Apollo mission to the moon. And then it's interesting because the rocks, when they came back and one of the greatest things that the United States did was to send it around to all the consulates across the globe. And so my dad took me to the consulate there and I looked at these rocks and I looked at all the unbelievable things that made possible. This thing that I could see as a young kid, I was an eight, nine year old kid at that time. And, and I was so excited, I mean, that this could be made possible. And you look at the moon and you, I mean, you just, you just, you know, you admire it, but then you actually have a piece of rock that you can actually look at and you're not allowed to touch it, of course, but you looked at it and you almost felt like you touched it. And you know, that excitement that, you know, science, and engineering and technology can actually do unbelievable, amazing things. So here I point to two things. One is a mentor, an implicit mentor that I had through my father who excited me. And also the, the things that you, know, you expose the bright minds to or the young aspiring minds to, you know, when they see something exciting about science that excites them. And the reason I share this is because we need both in droves across our nation to make sure that we inspire our young talent uh, in K to 12. I can tell you it works, it works. And therefore we need to double down and to see how we can make that all happen. And that's something that's some, I think I share that passion with Ellen. And we are very like my, I too pursued my first degree in physics, no wonder. And then of course I went into electrical computer engineering and then computer science engineering and so on, my journey. But I think, you know, we share this common passion that you can actually excite people by mentorship as well as things that you can you know expose them to so thank you so much for asking the question 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, the passion from both of you just shines right through. And I think that um, it also shows that uh, this widening of the pipeline and the widening of the types of people that are in the sciences, uh, you both represent that. And I know we're going to talk a bit more about that later. So we'll come back to that. Um, Jamie, if you'll put the uh, poll answer up, uh, why don't we turn to um, uh, this idea about the, the U.S.'s place in the world? Um, so in answering the question, where do you see the current status of uh, U.S. science and engin engineering leadership, uh, we see 5% saying that the U.S. continues to be the clear global s &E leader. Uh, we see over half, or exactly half of you saying that uh, the competition's tight, but that we're still among the global leaders. Um, and then we see about 43% saying that, uh, that we're slipping, uh, and then 2% of you are uh, at, the, at the other side of that, uh, that, that spectrum saying that we are no longer a, a global s &E leader. Well, um, uh, thank you for that, Jamie. Uh, I think that sets a, a great stage for um, uh, the first question I'm going to turn to Ellen on, which uh, Ellen, in May, the National Science Board put out its Vision 2030, uh, which identifies four roadmap areas that are going to be crucial to the U.S. science and engineering enterprise in the next decade. Uh, delivering benefits from research, developing STEM talent, expanding the geography of innovation, and fostering a global s &E community. Uh, what led you all uh, to choose these four areas, and, and, and does, it, does it relate to that, that spectrum that we just saw? Uh, it absolutely does. So, uh, of course, everybody on the board uh, was interested in, and had ideas about this, but we did hold, over a year, 12 listening sessions around the country and tried to talk to a wide variety of people. Of course, some of them were um, working in NSF itself at, at, a, at two or three different levels, um, but we met with researchers, um, you know, at R1 institutions, we went with them at much smaller, maybe in more rural areas, um, early career researchers, uh, uh, professors and researchers at some of the minority serving institutions, including HBCUs, um, academic inventors. And we, you know, basically, kind of our first question was, what does a thriving science and engine enterprise look like? What should it look like in 2030? What would that mean? And then, you know, as we talked, people were coming up with trends, including sort of what you just identified, which is the globalization of science and engineering um, and the growth of knowledge and technology intensive industries in general. And of course, uh, the growing demand for STEM talent, not just in the US, but around the world. So we asked them, well, how can America help keep its lead in fundamental research? How can discoveries continue to lead to a thriving economy and really empower US businesses and entrepreneurs? And how can the US increase STEM skills and opportunities for all Americans? So you can imagine we got reams and reams of inputs. <laughs> Probably the, the toughest part was, you know, how do you end up collating all that and sort of collecting it into a report that actually makes sense? Uh, we hope we were able to do that. Um, but in the end, it, it was, uh, we talked about what really the elements of leadership are. And then we uh, sort of ended the report with the roadmap in those four areas. So delivering benefits and really thinking about how do you speed the path from discovery to innovation? Uh, the talent, which you will hear me and I'm sure Panch talk about that over and over today. And in fact, we put in the report, talent is the treasure on which America's science and engineering enterprise really depend. Uh, so we really need to prioritize our diverse domestic talent and continue to welcome foreign talent. And then we also pointed out uh, we thought, the importance of expanding uh, the geography of innovation. So really building science and engineering capability and capacity across the country. And then of course, uh, continu continuing to shape the gl global culture of science and engineering. It's incredibly exciting. Uh, you know, when I, when I think about um, the, just to pick on one thread, uh, the geographic uh, dispersion of our, of our scientific resources, um, it's just, it's amazing to me uh, that we, in this uh, country of 330 million that we, we draw on our scientific talent from such a small pool. Um, and, and you all are definitely, uh, definitely identifying that as a priority area. Um, uh, Pancha, I've heard you talk about that many times. Uh, last week, you published an op-ed in, in Science. Uh, thank you for doing that. Outlining the importance of partnerships uh, to this strategic vision for NSF. Uh, do you want to elaborate on some of those uh, partnerships you envision, uh, how they further the NSF mission, and also how they can uh, even grow the, that geographic footprint that we're talking about? 
Uh, thank you for asking that question. I think, you know, uh, back to Ellen's point, just ex expanding on that, this is truly a, a privilege to, uh, as part of the National Science Board, before taking this role, uh, you know, this is a great vision. And uh, the, the elements of, you know, practice of science, talent, partnerships and infrastructure, and partnership is one of those very important components of that vision. And so as I came into this role, you know, I felt that partnership was an exceedingly important imperative for us as an agency. It's a foundation of everything that we do. When we looked at the three pillars of the vision that I talk about, advancing the frontiers of research into the future, accessibility and inclusivity, global science leadership that you touched upon, all three of them require this element of partnerships as the foundation. And partnerships have various types uh, and modes that, that you can think of when you think of partnerships. It is, first of all, it starts at home. How can you make sure that inside the agency, we have strong partnerships between the various disciplines that is you know, in the form of directorates? How can they all work together around taking grand challenges and attempting to solve those grand challenges or empowering the scientific community and catalyzing the scientific community to help solve those grand challenges? And so, for example, when you talk about the missing millions of talent, that's a grand challenge in my view. How do we bring this uh, talent across the socioeconomic and the geographic diversity of our great nation and inspire them, motivate them, enable them, bring that all to life. And this is something that you, you could you know, seriously call it as a grand challenge, which I think requires tremendous partnerships. And partnerships then not only includes partnerships within the agency, across the directorates, but across various agencies, all the agencies working together. One of the first things that I did after taking office in the first six weeks is talk to the heads of all the other agencies. How might we partner? How might we do more together? We can do this faster, better, stronger by partnering. And then I have had many listening sessions with industry leaders across the nation. Now, these days in COVID, while it's a challenge, it's also an opportunity. You swivel your chair and you go from California to Boston to talk to partners in, in industry and asking them, how can we do this better as an NSF to see how we can deliver the benefits of research that, that, uh, that Ellen alluded to as one of the uh, aspects of the 2030 vision. I said, that partnership with industry, I've talked to philanthropy and foundations and see how their objectives of how they want to unleash the talent, unleash the ideas across the nation, scientific ideas and talent. How might we partner with them? How might we partner with the K-12 system? But it, we cannot be done without partnering with K-12 system, community college systems, with the universities, with states and cities and local communities, which are also very interested in ensuring that this talent is unleashed, these ideas are unleashed for the betterment of society, humanity, and the economy. So how do you partner? And last but not the least, the global science partners. Now you talked about the survey that you just completed. I tell you the global science leadership is a shared imperative where we have like-minded partners across the globe who believe in the concept of openness, transparency, reciprocity, research integrity, and all thriving and driving to make sure that we are all making sure that we're working towards this goal of science for humanity. What better moment uh, of demonstration than it is today, as you will all agree. COVID has demonstrated to us, to us that the global partnerships can achieve a lot faster, a lot better. You talked about how fast the vaccines were unleashed. It's because of this global science partnership and the dedication to solving global grand challenge problems. So I'm truly excited, Sudeep, that we are going to be putting a lot more effort, as we're already doing, in ensuring that this partnership objective that the 2030 vision has laid out, that I'm laying out in terms of what the agency should be engaged in day in and day out to realize the goals and the aspirations our nation has. So we are in the vanguard of science and engineering innovation here in the United States. Terrific. It, it's so important that uh, we can we continue to be at that forefront, right? It's, it's not that, uh, that we might be withdrawing, it's that other nations are joining us at that forefront and we wanna make sure that we're, uh, we're playing an important role in setting that global culture. I love, I love the way you talk about that. Um, Ellen, uh, you know, hearing Ponch talk about COVID, um, you know, the, the Vision 2030, I think, was put together before, uh, before COVID came upon us. Uh, how has uh, the response to the pandemic um, uh, and the, the ability of the SNE community uh, to respond, how has that affected your thinking about, um, about NSF and its role uh, in the scientific enterprise? And, and would, there be any, would there be any updates to the Vision 2030 based on what we've learned? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't think we were anticipating this last year. And, and the pandemic has certainly reinforced, as Punch said, as you've said, uh, you know, why science and engineering is so important. But, you know, I, I really think we would come out, would have come out with a very similar vision. Again, we're trying to look forward 10 years and say, you know, what do we really need for a thriving science and engineering enterprise? 
Um, possibly we would have stressed urgency even more. Although if you look at our report, essentially, um, you know, other than the very first page that gives a full, few bullets, the next page is the case for urgency. And I think that was something we felt even before the pandemic and feel even more strongly uh, about now. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, a couple of other things that, um, that we mentioned when I talked about, you know, really what the elements of leadership were, one of which is partnership, one is talent, one is the practice of science and engineering, and, and one of them was infrastructure. And by that we meant, you know, not just uh, research infrastructure like large telescopes, but um, the whole cyber infrastructure and access to broadband. And of course, we were really thinking about, you know, researchers across the country and the ability for more people to use large data and take advantage of that. And yet with the pandemic, we saw how critically important that was for the pipeline, for the K through 12, and uh, how some people are being left behind because we don't have equal access to that. Yeah, yeah, that, that really came into stark relief this year, didn't it? When uh, suddenly it became very clear who had access to, uh, uh, to this information. Yes. And who didn't? Uh, it became just all too clear. Uh, Ponch, uh, you know, in, in sort of talking about that same issue, uh, in your strategic vision for NSF, you've talked about this importance of ensuring accessibility and inclusivity in STEM. Um, and I know that there are a myriad of, uh, of NSF programs that are dedicated to this. Um, how do these sort of come together? And are there opportunities for multi-agency efforts, uh, these partnerships you're talking about? Um, you know, we've got, we've got these democratic uh, demographic uh, elephants in the room, right? Uh, China and India that can bring many, many, many millions of people to the table. Uh, what are you thinking about in terms of this all hands on deck uh, a, a way of bringing people into the sciences? Absolutely, Sudeep. I mean, I'll tell you, I have, you talked about accessibility and inclusivity. I have my own personal experience in this because, you know, I, I ran a center which I founded uh, for um, improving accessibility for individuals with a variety of disabilities to be able to advance in their careers in science and engineering. And I tell you, through that experience, I've been humbled and I've learned so much about what you can do by inspiring talent across the socioeconomic, across all kinds of spectrum of abilities that are there that people have, right? So at NSF, we have a variety of programs, variety of programs at the K-12 level, you know, inspiring K-12 level of talent being brought to, brought to life. We have, of course, our research experiences for undergraduates. We have, of course, graduate students supported through research grants, but also programs like the GRFPs, which are you know, getting outstanding graduate talent you know, identified and then enabling them. Uh, and of course, we need to do a lot more in terms of scale. I keep talking about that because we need to strengthen at speed and scale. Going to the previous talk about how do we keep ourselves globally competitive, strengthening at speed and scale. We have career grants through which, again, a significant part of the career grant is about the educational objectives that the young faculty members as they enter their career, you know, focusing on education and inspiring and motivating talent through, the, through, the, through their research. That's something that is there. And then you have various other grants that also brings in talent, a diverse talent pool. Yes, so there are a number of programs already in place and there are pilots specifically addressing, you know, talent that we need to br bring out from, you know, the HPCUs, the HSIs, the teacups, ATEs, and so the, the grants specifically targeted to make sure that we are not missing any talent behind. We still keep talking about the missing millions. So we're working hard on that. But the key here, Sudeep, is we need to scale faster. Yes, these programs are good. They bring out these unbelievable ideas for bringing out the talent. No question about that. Yeah. But they are just not enough. So NSF itself needs to scale these programs faster. But then scaling also happens to your point that you talked about with interagency partnerships. We are all in this together. It takes a village to get this done. Therefore, the interagency partnership, for example, our partnership with NASA on K-12 inspiration is just truly spectacular, right? So that's what we talk about is interagency partnerships can inspire more in terms of you know, the people being brought to, uh, motivated and brought to life. And then industry, our conversation with the industry has always been about their interest in getting more of the talent into the pipeline because they want the talent to manifest itself and express itself. So, you know, they are beneficiaries and then they know that benefits economy, humanity and society. So I can go on and on about talent again through partnerships, but we are going to be working on every aspect of partnerships to see how we can have this talent grow at speed and scale. 
Bunch, I like I like that so much. And uh, when you talk about scale, uh, you know, scale comes from people, and scale comes from uh, from resources. And I'll, I'll I'll come back to those resources. But you certainly seem to have the um, uh, the attention of Congress right now uh, in several uh, uh, several opportunities. I think in legislation to increase those resources. So uh, at AAAS, you know, we certainly believe that um, uh, that there is a, a a vast um, uh, opportunity uh, if we can find the resources to, to, to fund those efforts. So uh, we'll come back to that. Um, Ellen, uh, before we turn to audience questions, and I'm going to turn to those, so please uh, start putting your questions in the q and I see many there already. Um, Ellen, uh, I'm going to ask a question sort of um, asking you to, uh, first of all, to look back maybe on this year and say, you know, in a year of incredible discovery, um, what's something that has excited you the most in any field that's excited you that might be awe-inspiring for, um, uh, for young people who might want to get either uh, supportive of science or into the sciences, what's something that just comes to mind and says, wow, you know, I, I, I love that because there are so many, I feel like there's just so many, but uh, Ellen, uh, what, what's on your oh, mind? Oh gosh, you know, I, I, I don't know how it's possible to pick just one. You know, one of the things that I think, um, you know, sort of shows the success of NSF is every year when the Nobel Prize winners get announced. And of course, particularly in physics and chemistry, but again, this year also in economics, where you can point back to and say, you know, NSF supported their research. You know, sometimes it was decades ago, sometimes more frequently. You can think about, you know, Jennifer Doudna this year with the, with the CRISPR technology. And it, it really gives you that, um, that confidence and, you know, sort of reinforces the support for NSF and the mission of NSF that we are looking at, you know, basic research and really trying to understand how the world works. And that um, is not at all in conflict with then trying to understand how do you use it to improve the world? How do you use it to solve challenges that affect people's loved ones, that affect the strength and resiliency of communities? And so, you know, there were um, so many items like that that you could point to where you could say, you know, this is the unique part of NSF. It's, it's the agency in the federal government that supports fundamental research across you know, this very broad um, area of disciplines. In, in a lot of cases, you don't know exactly where it's gonna lead, but, but doing the work and then continuing to understand and make connections. And I think that's something Ponch really wants to work on, making connections. You, you, know, you can think of partnerships that way um, so that other people are aware of what's, what the research is showing us and can try to understand how can we use it to, um, as NSF's mission say, advance the nation's health, welfare, and prosperity? Yeah, that's what's so exciting to me about NSF is that uh, these kernels uh, of uh, of discovery uh, they 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 over the course of years become huge parts of our economy, uh, or they become huge parts of our understanding of the world, and and both those things are, are just incredibly valuable to the American people. I think. Uh, Ponch, how about you? Uh, is, there, is there something that stands out in the year and something that would be inspirational to, to young people looking to get into the sciences? So the thing is, I mean, at the end of the day, let's take COVID moment, right? I mean, if you look at the number of undergraduate research projects that are building masks, that are building, you know, PPE equipment. I mean, these are people who just, you know, in two weeks pivoted to how can you take my innovative ideas working across disciplines and how might you configure solutions? I mean, Sudeep, isn't this so exciting to see our young talent ready to engage, even at K-12 level? Let's find solutions to this problem. Let's see how we can bring our ideas together through the 3D printing of devices and technologies and solutions that can help people in this moment that people need help you know, in an accelerated manner. I've seen so many projects like that, NSF funded and otherwise. I mean, in the institution that I used to be at before I got to NSF, Arizona State University, a group of young you know, undergraduate researchers got together, built a mask, and won the X prize of a million dollars. I mean, we had put the program together when I was there. And you see that, I mean, you see the creativity, you see the energy. They are not deterred by anything. I mean, so I get so excited by this energy that is there, Sudeep. So as us, NSF, and all the agencies, NSB. So it is really our responsibility, therefore, to empower them, to unleash this latent talent that is there, to see how we can get them to express the unbelievable futures that we are imagining for the future. Believe me, they are all there. They are resident. They are latent. It's our responsibility. So I take it as NSF is doing some of that and the many examples of it. And you see it in our website. I encourage people to go to our website. We tell stories. I like storytelling. 
you, you see stories of people who are doing amazing things. And that inspires me, I tell you, every day. Gets me waking up and saying, you know, yet another story today or more stories today that I'm going to look at and be more even inspired. So thank you so much. And I, I, I mean, uh, I welcome people to visit our website and learn more of the kinds of explorations that happens because of NSF funded research and other agency funded research. Terrific, thank you, Panch. All right, uh, let's turn to some audience questions. Uh, there are quite a few here. Um, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with one that says, while the US leads in terms of scientific progress, uh, we lag in terms of scientific literacy and trust among the general population. Uh, how are these issues related and what are NSF's plans to promote improved science literacy uh, among the general public and not just STEM students and professionals, uh, you know, building that trust ahead of time. We've seen it uh, in this past year, right? And when I talk about the challenges where we've fallen flat uh, is when we've had to communicate uh, with the public. Um, uh, Ellen, uh, Ponch, uh, what are your thoughts there? So, I mean, maybe I could start and tell you that, you know, unfortunately we keep this science as a best kept secret. All of us are responsible. We all have a responsibility here. So I keep telling NSF that, you know, we need to go be out there you know, be out there storytelling, talking about the impact and the inspiration that science has and what it does for humanity, science, society, and so on. So I think all of us have a shared responsibility here. Triple A's, you do a great job. You know, the board does a great job. NSF is increasingly doing a great job. And then I want everybody to feel that each one of us own this responsibility. And that as scientists and engineers, we need to excite people about our journey. Like the question that you asked today, I mean, the stellar journey that literally Ellen had. I mean, how exciting it is for somebody to listen to that and feel inspired, right? So we need to story tell our own journeys that I, I have no doubt it will inspire people rather than only sitting in our lab, as, as important as it is, as good as it is, and doing our science and, and you know, uh, unleashing amazing ideas and, and other things that we do. But we have a responsibility to talk about the importance of science and bring out the scientific spirit that is, you know, exciting to others and you know it becomes an infectious thing and that's what we need to do more of and we all bear a responsibility in that effort and that's what is going to change the view of science and therefore engagement in science itself that's great uh, ellen thoughts on the on trust yeah absolutely and you know part of it i believe is the scientific community providing i would say clear and accessible um, information and uh, I think, in fact, AAAS has a, has a new institute, which is helping to provide that to uh, policymakers and, and leaders so that they have a, a specific place to turn to. You know, it, it is, you know, I've, I've sort of obviously seen this change and it, it makes me think back to my first two shuttle flights where we were studying the Earth's atmosphere and particularly the problem of ozone hole and ozone depletion. And you know, it was in the 1970s when the basic research showed that there was this connection between using chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs, which would eventually make their way into the stratosphere and migrate and uh, contribute to the depletion of ozone. And it's interesting, but public opinion at that time uh, was, a, was convinced that there were, in, there were risks to humans. It was something we needed to do something about. Um, the Montreal Protocol was developed. It was signed by every single country in the UN. And really that's the kind of uh, situation that we want to make sure that we have where the best information that's out there, people understand how you use critical peer review to really determine what that is. Um, you know, it's not just uh, one person hypothesizing and showing some data, it's all these other people coming in saying, well, what else could be causing that? Let's model that, let's, let's take more data and let's make sure that as we move forward, we're using the, the best information. That's, that's great. Uh, Ellen, I have to say that I'm so jealous that you can casually say, uh, it makes me think of my first two shuttle <laughs> flights. Um, that's, uh, that, that, that's quite a lead in to an answer. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I, you're, thank you for pointing out some of the AAAS efforts here. This is something we care about deeply. Um, you know, someone was talking to me about, hey, we need to create the next Carl Sagan. Uh, and I keep saying that's the last war. You know, we need 150,000 scientists who are able to communicate well uh, and be, uh, be able to, to shine a light on uh, the shared values that we scientists have with our communities. Um, and so I'm just so glad to hear the, uh, to hear the way you're thinking about it as well. Um, let me turn to, the, to another question here from the audience. Um, 
uh, we have a question that says, uh, you know, how would NSF prioritize its programs if it had received more than the enacted FY 2021 amount? And what would be a game changing percentage for NSF? Uh, this goes back to that scale, I think, right? Uh, scale is, is awesome. And I know that it's tough uh, as, a, as an agency head sometimes to answer these questions, but I can tell you that uh, as, as AAAS, we believe that there's a vast um, amount of research that is wonderful and needed to grow the economy, uh, to increase our well-being, to, to, uh, to hopefully make our brains better from understanding ourselves uh, that, uh, that could still be done. Ellen, uh, you're, you're probably freer to answer that question. Why don't I turn to you? Uh, well, thank you. Um, you know, I think a couple of points that we made in, again, in the vision report were number one, vastly more investment is needed. And I, and we, I do use the word investment. It's not funding. It's it's investing in our country's future. It, re it really is. And I think the, um, you know, what you get out of it is so clear. Although, as you say, we always need to uh, be advocating for that. Um, but we also made the point that it isn't just investment, right? There are other things that we need to be doing. We need to be thinking about how we take a different view, how we look at things a little bit differently, how we really focus on the talent that we're missing, the missing millions and making sure that the science and engineering enterprise is welcoming, that people who come in, especially those who are um, vastly underrepresented, you know, feel respected and valued and, and really see those interesting careers out there. And so we have uh, worked with NSF and we continue as a board to say, it's not just about doing the same thing with more money, it's about doing things differently. And I, I wanted to point out another program that uh, AAAS is doing, which is the Sea Change Program. And one of the things I like about that is it's now uh, institutions. So they have this ability to do a self-assessment in terms of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and then eventually get a, a rating, uh, which has uh, you know an analog with the lead rating for buildings, which people are very familiar with. So you can imagine as that program goes that in the future funding agencies could say, well, as we think about um, proposals that we get for centers or institutes, we under want to understand how they're doing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, their sea change rating could be something that uh, could be you know, used as a way for a proposal to be evaluated as one criterion. So it's really about you know, how do we move the needle and thinking about different ways of doing that than, than what we're doing right now. Yeah, thank you, Ellen, for mentioning Sea Change. I, I, I'm a, a huge proponent of that program. Uh, we at AAAS are going to be investing more in that program this year because we would like to see many, many more universities participating uh, in the coming year. Uh, Ponch, uh, going to, to the scale issue, uh, I can ask the question a different way, perhaps. Yes. Uh, uh, are there, uh, what percentage of grants that are sort of the, the investigator initiated get funded uh, by NSF? Is it, is it? That's an excellent question, Sudeep. So I could, uh, first of all, I want to say, I'm so grateful for the Congress, the bipartisan support in Congress for science and what, what NSF has been benefiting in terms of being able to fund those amazing ideas and talent. So we are very grateful to Congress. Sudeep, you have been uh, in the appropriations, uh, you know, as a, a committee as a staffer, you know this, you know, you all work really hard and I want to express my gratitude to all of you. So I just want to start first there. And now to the question that you asked me, you know, if you, you know, when I came into the agency, I asked myself the question, you know, how many of those grants, exactly the question that you asked, how many of those grants are funded that, you know, uh, that, 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 that grants don't fund, get funded that should be funded. In other words, rated highly, but don't get funded. The average, uh, you know, success rate in NSF is about 20%, right? So it turns out that we, you know, leave you know the proposals in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the cutting uh, you know a block if you may. Uh, if you were to actually fund all those ideas that are worthy of funding that have been recommended funding uh, to Ellen's point that have been you know peer reviewed in the rigorous way, it turns out it's one third of the proposals. That is thirty three percent right there. Now, if you had to actually look at the funding uh, the, the the duration of the, the projects, you would think that on average it's three years. An ideal thing would be four to five years because that's what it takes for these ideas to mature and then have the impact that it desires. And then if you look at the size of the projects and say, you know, are, are we right sizing the funding, right? And you would say that, you know, you probably another 33% increase in that size of the funding. If you were to put all of this together, just, just the ideas that are out there already that we are leaving out, that is almost the doubling of the NSF budget. Okay? So right there, you have a number 
that tells you the amount of ideas that is there across the nation to unleash the talent and the ideas. And then now you add on top of that, the amazing programs that you want to engage with partners and then unleash this, you know, regions of economic activity, innovation centers, and a whole host of things. And I talk about it in the form of the DNA of NSF being exploratory research and translational research intertwined and influencing each other. If you want to realize the full potential of all of that for our nation to be globally competitive, to be vibrant as a nation in terms of economic progress, societal progress, I can tell you there's a lot more that can be done because the ideas are out there, the talent is out there. That's our responsibility to unleash all of that. Thanks, Panch. Well, I can I can tell you I'm I'm not tethered by uh by being in an administration, so I can tell you that at AAAS we believe that we could double the NSF budget and uh, and actually be doing incredible work, incredible science, uh, and growing the economy even faster. So uh, that uh, that's something we truly believe. Uh, I'm going to turn to a question uh, uh, from from actually from Neil Lane. Um, Neil, thank you for being in the audience today. Uh, Neil asks, uh, you know, one of NSF's many successes was LIGO. Uh, which detected gravitational waves. And so this gets back to this issue of things that inspire me, right? And uh, just the, the fact that we can see two uh, black holes crashing into each other um, is directly for the first time. And that resulted in Nobel Prizes for its leaders. It was expensive and it took many years. It's a risk. Um, and it didn't promise any immediate uh, practical application. Um, how hard is it to get something like that funded today? Is that still possible? Ellen, do you want to get started? Or, uh... Well, uh, I think it is possible. I do think it hinges on the level of investment that actually comes to NSF because uh, you have all these different areas of science and many of them do have ideas for some amazing facilities, but it takes money to actually make these facilities happen. So now NSF has a very difficult job in terms of understanding large number of ideas, how do we actually narrow it down and decide which ones we're gonna move forward on? And of course, a lot of that depends on how much funding is available. And so I do believe that there is strong support still for basic research. And in fact, uh, just as Ponch has this opportunity, I also have the opportunity to talk to members of Congress that are part of our authorizing and appropriations committees or the committee staff and, and I will say, you know, there, there really is bipartisan support. They understand the importance of science and maybe not, you, you don't always see that in the paper. So I, you know, I, I, I really do want to emphasize that. So if we can have the ability to fund more facilities across more disciplines, uh, then I think it's not seen as, oh, you're just putting all your eggs in one basket and we're not completely sure of what the return of investment are that, you know, they trust that NSF will make the right decisions. I will, I mean, excellent, uh, Ellen. I mean, I, what I would like to add to that, Sudeep, is to say that NSF is constantly looking at investment in facilities of the future. Now, Ellen talked about the Nobel Prizes, right? Uh, and, and how NSF has played a role. And in a, much of the facilities that NSF invests in makes possible those kinds of fundamental discoveries. And that's what NSF is really good at and it will continue to invest. And clearly, you know, we need more, no question about that. And that's where, you know, one other mechanism by which we're also doing that is also working with other agency partners. You know, we work with NASA, we work with NOVA, we work with NIST, we work with all partners that we can find in order that we might, you know, leverage more and Department of Energy and, and, and NIH, I don't want to miss anybody out here. It's just that that's, that's why I'm keen to develop for these partnerships so that we have our common aspirations brought together in terms of seeing what can be done together more effectively than any one agency is able to do at any point in time. But so that we don't leave good science progress behind because we did not invest in this high risk, high reward. Because Vannevar Bush's conceptualization for NSF was all about high risk, high reward research investments for the, uh, for the discoveries of the future. And therefore we need to uh, double down our efforts in terms of making sure that we are not shortchanging that future. And this goes to the previous question that you asked, you know, investments, critical investments are necessary for us to be able to do that at speed, at scale, and so that we might be in the vanguard of innovation, continue to be that. And so Neil, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, you know, thank you for your service also, sir. All right, I can't believe that the time has already flown by uh, and we are at the end of our, at the end of our time. Uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of liberty and ask you one last question, even if it goes a minute over and I apologize for, the, for going a minute over, but this is an important one, I think. You're both in your first year uh, in these roles. Um, when you look back at the end of your tenure, uh, hopefully a long time from today, um, what do you hope uh, 
we've uh, we've accomplished? What what needle do you hope to move? Because you know, in these jobs, it's tremendous. You have seven billion dollars worth of uh, stuff going on. Uh, it's hard to move the needle on everything. What is something that you really hope uh, you can accomplish in that time period? And I'll, uh, Ellen, I'll start with you, and then I'll turn to Punch. Okay, you know, as a board, we probably um, are taking a little bit longer term view, and that's what that's why we put put out the vision. Mm -hmm. And even though we work closely with NSF in terms of what they are funding year by year, and of course, you know, it's a it's a yearly budget process, as you know, uh, we are really trying to ensure the overall health of the science and engineering enterprise. So, if you kind of look at look at the first page of our vision report, we talked about seven attributes that we want to be. Um, moving toward so that it would describe the science and engineering enterprise in 2030. You know, I won't mention all of them, but obviously government, academia, and industry working together to realize national research and development priorities and accelerate that uh, discovery to innovation cycle is one. Um, creating a more accessible and attractive science and engineering enterprise that more closely reflects the nation's demographic and, and geographic diversity. Um, that NSF, of course, um, continues to drive U.S. Uh, innovation through fundamental research. So overall, it really is about the investments needed to fuel this innovation, along with new processes, new procedures, new partners um, that will allow us to do it. So let me just thank you for the AAAS support for that. And I hope that um, people listening, no matter uh, what organization they're from, they'll uh, look at making a commitment to, to helping make that vision happen. Great, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Panch, how about you? Uh, Sudeep, I mean, I talk about strengthening at speed and scale. So six years from now, when my, my, when my term uh, finishes, if I were to look back, and that's what you're asking me to reflect on, I would tell you the most important thing is to ensure that we would have moved the needle in a big way in, at speed and scale in terms of unleashing the talent. The missing million should not be talked about missing anymore. Okay? That should be our, our, our top priority, our top priority. Combined with that, we should have this amazing outcomes that we make possible. The regional innovation centers, the Bell Lab-like entities that I talk about in my vision talks, that to the public-private partnership, where NSF is a, one of the catalyzing forces that unleashes these regions of economic vibrancy, innovation centers all across the nation, it should be in every part of the geography of this nation. And we should see that. We should see this coming about because that's exceedingly important for our talent and ideas to be fully, fully materialized. I think these are, these are very important objectives. Clearly, we should always ensure that the goal of NSF, which is advancing exploratory research into the future, we are always ahead, always ahead in terms of thinking into the future and all the Nobel Prizes of the next six years should all be people who have been NSF funded and that we are, what we are doing now is the Nobel prizes of the 2030s, 40s and 50s. And I want to see that happen. And when I look back and you know, when I'm in my armchair, you know, when I'm hopefully I get to live 90, 90 years and I look back and I say, ah, that Nobel prize that happened when I, you know, that project, the career award that was given to the young faculty member, that would be heartwarming. If we can get these three things when I look back, I tell you, we would serve ourselves very well as a nation. And, I, and, and I'm so humbled that NSF, you know, as, as, as a leader of NSF, that we will have NSF as a vehicle that makes it happen, as one of the vehicles that makes it happen, an important vehicle that makes it happen. So Deep, thank you so much. Thank you so much to you and AAAS for all the support that you provide. I think that is a, you know, a partnership that I cherish deeply. And I hope that we will continue to advance with that partnership and I want to acknowledge my board members, my board colleagues, and my board chair and vice chair. They are an amazing team. Amazing. For those of the people who may not know, I tell you, there's an amazing group of people who selflessly serve to advance the goals of science, technology, and engineering for our nation, and specifically the advancement of NSF. So I am grateful to all of them for their service. So thank you so much. Wow. Uh, Punch, Ellen, I got to tell you, you know, uh, the beginning of 2021 has not been uh, the smoothest ride and uh, it is sometimes uh, sometimes feel very challenging and the weight of the world is, I think, on a lot of people's shoulders. Uh, I hope that people see that the passion uh, of these leaders, the passion uh, and the possibilities 
uh, of the National Science Foundation and the other parts of our scientific enterprise are really where uh, the optimism of the future lies. And, uh, and this is where we need to turn our attention, turn our brain power and turn our energy. So uh, thank you very much to all of you for attending. Thank you very much to our two leaders. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all soon, hopefully in a real fireside chat uh, in person. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Sudeep, and thank you, Punch. We're so fortunate to have you at the helm of NSF. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Sudeep. Hey, everybody. Have a wonderful day.